In this video, we're going to talk about financial intermediaries. What are financial intermediaries? Financial intermediaries are those people who buy and sell money. Just like any commodity, money can be bought and sold. So who are the players that get to are involved in the buying and selling of money? Well, they're insurance agents, or insurance companies, banks, loan agencies, credit unions, and people of that nature. These are the some, just a short list of some of those people that are involved in the buying and selling of money. Well, I mentioned banks. Let's focus a little bit on commercial banks and how do they buy and sell money? Well, commercial banks, they borrow money from depositors at a low interest rate and they turn around and sell it to borrowers at a high interest rate. So next time you go into the bank and you look at or you look, go online for online banking, you look at your savings account, typically every so often you get a little bit of an interest payment onto it. Especially if you look at your savings account and you look at over at a course of five or six months and you have say a thousand or two thousand dollars in there, you might get lucky and get four or five cents worth of interest every once in a while. Well, what's happening? You put money into a savings account and that bank turns around and takes your money and loans it out to somebody else. Well, in exchange for them borrowing your money, this bank is literally borrowing your money. They pay you a small interest. Maybe it's something as small as 0.02% or maybe 0.2%. And then what do they do with that money that they borrowed from you? They turn around and they loan it out. So they borrow at a low interest rate and they loan it out at a high interest rate of say 4.5%. So they're borrowing from you at less than 1% and they're loaning it out to somebody else at 4.5 or 6 or 7% sometimes for like a home mortgage or a car loan or their student loans. So that's how banks typically make money is they borrow at a low interest rate from depositors and they turn around and sell it to borrowers at a high interest rate. And hopefully the difference between these two interest rates are enough to cover the cost. So then we have the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve System is the people taxed with regulating these commercial banks or regulating US, the US banking system. So we have the Federal Reserve System and they came in and they set up a requirement of required reserves. What required reserves are is every bank is required to keep a certain percentage of all deposits on hand to cover withdrawals. So if you walk into a bank and you hand them $200 and you go back a week later, you expect to be able to withdraw the all $200 of that money that you have in the bank. You say, that's my money. I'm leaving it with you for safekeeping. And because of that, whenever I want it back, I should be able to get it back. And as a result, the, Fe the Federal Reserve System came in and said, we're going to set up a required reserves. So that way, if customer A, like me, goes and puts $200 in the bank and I come back a week later, I can withdraw all $200 because a certain percentage of all deposits need to remain in one of two places, either held in the vault or held by the Fed for that bank. How distraught would you be if you walked into a bank and you said, I deposited $200 in here last week, I need to withdraw 50 and that bank turned around and looked at you and said, sorry, we can't do it, we don't have your $50. Looking at me and say, what do you mean you don't have my $50? I put it in here a week ago, where's my $50? And, and the bank turns around and says, oh, we loaned it out. Wouldn't you be a little upset? Wouldn't you kind of be panicked because now you can't get your money out? Well, that's why the required reserve is set up in order to ensure that all withdrawals will be covered. Now, a bank doesn't want to keep all $200 of the amount of money that you deposited in the bank. They don't want to do it. What good does it do for them for you to put $200 in their bank and they just sit on it? It does them absolutely no good. Banks are in the business of, remember, buying and selling money. So what they do is they take that money that you deposited and they loan it out to somewhere else. And, but the amount that they can loan out is the total deposits minus the required reserves. So they, you put in say $200 in deposits, they're required to keep 20%, so they keep $40 out of that. 
they have $160 left to spend. This is known as loanable funds. And then any funds, let's say they have now have $160 to loan out. And let's say they only loan out, say, 130 of it. Well, now they have $30 of excess funds or excess reserves. These are loanable funds that are not loaned out. And we can actually see that in these two examples. We have Bank A and Bank B. Both of them have a deposit of $200. Both have a required reserve of 20%. So they must keep $40 in required reserves. That means they now have $160 in loanable funds. Because we have the deposits minus required reserves gives them the loanable funds. Well, let's say that Bank A decides that they are going to loan out all $160 of their loanable funds. They have now zero excess reserves. That means that they are fully utilizing their resources. Remember, banks are in the business of buying and selling money. And because of that, they want to fully use all of their loanable funds because that's the money that they're selling. They aren't selling the required reserves, they're selling the loanable funds. So by them fully utilizing all of their loanable funds, they are fully utilizing all of their resources. Now let's look at Bank B. Same deal, but whenever it comes down to here, they have $160 of loanable funds. They only loan out $130. That means they now have $30 in excess reserves. They are not fully utilizing their resources. So this one, Bank B, is giving up money because they now have 30 more dollars that they can loan out at a high interest rate. They're having to pay interest on this 30% or this $30. So they want to loan it out as least as much as they possibly can and start receiving a payment on that $30 as well. Because this is money that's just sitting there not doing them anything. They don't really like that. They want to loan out as much as they possibly can. Here's where you got to start walking a tightrope though. By this bank not loaning out this money, they're losing money because this is unutilized resources. They're lo losing profit off of it. But let's say bank A. What happens if somebody comes in and withdraws money from the bank? What if they didn't have $200 anymore to loan out? Somebody comes in and withdraws $30 or $5. Well, they withdraw it out of that required reserves. They withdraw it out of their reserves, right? So now they only have $35 left in required reserves. And that's less than 20% of 195 because remember, they only have $195 in deposits now. So now this bank has $100 or has $35 in reserves, but that doesn't meet the full 20% of the required reserves. They now do not have the amount of reserves that they must have as mandated by the Federal Reserve System. Essentially, they're more or less breaking the law. They, and they must have all 20% of these required reserves. So what happens? They have to borrow from somewhere else. They can borrow from either another commercial bank or from the Federal Reserve System itself. So, if they don't have enough regards reserves, they have to borrow money. But whenever you borrow money, you're paying these high interest rates that we talked about right up here. So, whenever you're in this situation where you loan out all of your loanable funds and somebody comes and withdraws money out of that your deposits, well now you don't have all the required reserves you need and as a result, you have to borrow money from somewhere else and you have to pay a high price for it. But if you're in this situation and you haven't loaned out all of your loanable funds, you're just letting money sit on the table. So banks have to walk a very tight rope between either loaning out all their loanable funds and running the risk of somebody withdrawing money or having some excess reserves and losing money on that aspect. So how do banks get their money? We said that you're going to go in there and you're going to deposit money in that bank and that's the money that they're going to get for loanable funds, right? Well, why do you put money in the bank? Just stop and think about it. Why, why exactly do you put money in the bank? Well, there's three basic motives behind it. The first one is safety. You don't 
want to have all of your cash just laying around the house. You want to put it in the bank because you assume that the bank is safer than your house. You don't want to just stuff it all in your mattress and then heaven forbid somebody coming in there and rob you and rob you clean. Now you have no money and you could have been potentially hurt in the transaction. So you put all of your money in the bank because it's safekeeping. The second reason is convenience. If it weren't for the banking system, then assume you have to go pay your bills at the end of the month and you don't have checks. All you have is cash and you don't have any other way of paying for it. And you want to go pay your cell phone bill, your water bill, your electricity bill, your gas bill, your internet bill. That's five different bills, not to mention maybe a car loan or anything like that. You have to go to now one, two, three, four, five, six different places and pay cash for what you're doing. So now at the end of the day, you have to drive around to six different places while you're in town and pay cash for everything. But think about it this way. If you put all your money in the bank or put some money in the bank, you could just sit down at your table that night and write out six different checks, slap a stamp on it, and send it out in the mailbox the next morning. A lot more convenient. Nowadays, it's becoming even more convenient because it's all through online bill pay. Matter of fact, you can sit down at your table and rather than writing out checks, you just go and click a couple buttons, type in a couple numbers, and heck, all six bills of you, all six of your bills are now paid. So it's a lot more convenient to have your money in the bank because now you can pay for bills through checks and debit cards and accounts. And it's a lot more convenient than trying to go in and pay cash to six different utility establishments. And then the last one is avarice. Avarice is kind of an interesting one. It has to deal with greed. We say that humans are inherently greedy. And even if that sounds abrasive to you or abrupt to you, we are greedy. We're greedy people. We prefer, we prefer more to less. So as a result, this avarice is the last reason why we put money in the bank. If you go to put money in a savings account, and if you put money in a savings account, you expect to have something come back. You expect to get paid interest on that savings account. Otherwise, you wouldn't put money in that savings account. What's the reason of putting money in that savings account if you don't get interest on it? Or putting money in certificate of deposits, or putting money somewhere here or somewhere there. Well, you hope to get a little bit of a payment off of it. You hope to get interest off of it. So, if you have rising interest rates, rising interest rates increase the deposits. So if you have a savings account of 1% and somebody else has a savings account of 2%, you're more inclined to go ahead and put your money in that savings account that's earning you 2% interest. Another option of that is you could put money in certificate of deposits. Certificate of deposits, the higher the interest is, the more they expect you to put in. So the higher the interest, because you're greedy and you want more money, the higher the interest, the more inclined you are to put money in a savings account, in a certificate of deposit. Although, if you lower the interest rates, say they're five, six percent, but now they start dropping to three, four, less than one percent, like we often see in a lot of our savings accounts, you're more inclined to take that money out of a savings account and putting in something else like the stocks, which you hopefully are earning five or six percent interest. So what we find out that is as interest rates increase, so do deposits. People put more money in the savings account and more money in certificate of deposits and other time deposits as interest rates increase because we're greedy. And as interest rates fall, we take money out of those savings accounts and put it over here where we hopefully earn more interest. So as a result, the supply of loanable funds is upward sloping, as we can see right here. As interest rates increase, people are more inclined to put money in these savings accounts in the bank. So the quantity of loanable funds increase. So the deal with supply of loanable funds, we increase as the interest rates increase, so it slopes upward. Whereas we deal with the demand for loanable funds. So these are the people putting money in the bank to save. These are the people who are borrowing money for whatever reason. Maybe it's a house. 
Maybe it's a business trying to build something. It's uh, somebody buy, trying to buy a car. So we have consumers, first off. We have two different entities that are borrowing money. We have consumers and businesses or firms. So consumers, as interest rates decrease, or low interest rates actually encourage borrowing. So a great way to think about this is if you could go out and get a car loan for, say, 2%, well, you might be inclined to go out and buy that car and actually pay on that loan. But let's say the interest raise rise from 2% up to, say, 5%. Well, now you sit back and you say, man, that interest rate, that rising interest rate is going to cost me more money. So I think I might just keep my old clunker for a few more years and save up money and maybe pay cash. So what happens is as interest rates increase on loans, you find that people tend to save more. They tend to stop borrowing and they just hold on to what they have. But as interest rates begin to fall, it encourages people to borrow that money because it's now not costing them there near as much. Same thing with firms. Low interest rates make investments more profitable. So firms are gonna be trying to take out loans on either buildings or equipment or anything of that nature. And low interest rates mean that the cost of that loan are actually lower. If the cost of the loan is lower, that means that chances are the investment is going to become more profitable or might even become profitable. So what we find is that low interest rates make more investments profitable. And if an investment is profitable, you're going to take out that loan on that investment in order to capitalize on that profit. So as interest rates fall, we find more investments become more profitable. But as interest rates rise, we start to find that some of these investments that were maybe right on the line of being profitable are no longer profitable. And when they're no longer profitable, the business isn't going to take out the loan on it. So what we start to see is as interest rates fall, people demand more loans. They demand to borrow more money, causing this line to slope downward. So if we look back at our graph right here, this is the supply, the equilibrium of loanable funds. So we see that demand slopes downward. As interest rates fall, people demand more funds. They demand more loans. So just like we saw back in chapter three, we have supply and demand equilibrium. And we now have a supply and demand equilibrium for loanable funds. As interest rates rise, people put more money in the bank to save more. As interest rates fall, people demand more loans. So where we find that these two intersect is our equilibrium. And that equilibrium price, just like we learned back in chapter 3, this is the equilibrium price. Well, how do you really put a price on money? Have you ever thought about that? You can't say, we've been talking about buying and selling money over here, but what is the price of the money? price of the money is the interest rate. So what we find is an equilibrium interest rate between the supply, the supply of loanable funds and the demand of loanable funds. But does that really occur in reality? We see it move in this way and it happens to where we find an equilibrium interest rate for loanable funds. But the, the interest at which they're being supplied and interest at which they're being demanded are not going to be the same. Because in reality, reality, we go back to here. We say that banks are borrowing money at a low interest rate and selling money at a high interest rate. So what we actually see is something more like this. Oh, I'm sorry, I drew that the wrong way. The interest rate at which are the the interest rate at which the loans are being supplied or the supply of loanable funds is actually going to be somewhere down here. Because remember we said that banks borrow at a low interest rate and they sell at a high interest rate and the difference covers their cost. So as a result, they are borrowing money from these people 
depositing it in the bank. So banks, remember the customers are depositing the money in the banks and they pay a low interest rate for it right there. They turn around and uh, loan out that money at this interest rate. So we do see in reality a slight discrepancy here. It's, we will not find a true equilibrium interest rate where the amount that or the price at which it's being supplied is equal to the price at which it's being demanded simply because we have these financial intermediaries who are in the business of buying and selling money and they're going to buy at a low interest rate and sell at a high interest rate. So we discovered, we, in this video we discussed financial intermediaries and they buy and sell money. These are the people like the insurance companies, banks, loan agencies, and credit unions. We discussed commercial banks about how they actually buy and sell money through different interest rates. We discussed required reserves, loanable funds, and excess reserves. We also discussed the supply of loanable funds. Why there's a supply of loanable funds, and it's because of these three basic motives. And how rising interest rates increase the deposits in the bank, supply of loanable funds slope upward. We discussed the demand for loanable funds, and that as interest rates fall, that increases the demand for loanable funds, but as interest rates rise, Typically, people want to start saving more, so the demand for loanable funds falls. So as a result, it slopes downward. We find that there is a theoretical equilibrium between the, the interest rate between the supply and demand, and that that equilibrium price is known as the interest. But in reality, we find two slightly different interest rates because of the fact that banks are trying to buy low and sell high.